Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Corporal Lights Podcast, where we take shit seriously. I'll be your host, Marty, and uh, hand it over to Rick to introduce himself. Hey guys, um, my name is Rick Charles, I'm also known as the Rogue Creationist. I am author of the uh, Rogue Creationist blog. Uh, you can find me at uh, therogecreationist.weebly.com. Um, I'm a paleontology enthusiast um, and a zookeeper. So I love biology, I love animals, and I love dinosaurs. I'll hand it over to Fred. Hey guys, it's Fred from Fred the Dinosaur Man. I'm on YouTube. I think many many know me. Not that many, but <laughs> I do lots of claymations <laughs> and stuff on YouTube. And you can find me at you know on YouTube, Fred the Dinosaur Man. And hope you enjoy our podcast. And I'll hand over to David. Okay, uh, my name's David Perdue. I am a I am a artist. A I have a a profile on DeviantArt, so you should probably look me up. My name is Matrix Dragon David on uh, DeviantArt, and I, um, I I I draw. <laughs> I I draw. I've, <laughs> I I've um I've always been interested in dinosaurs and any animals that even remotely remind me of them. So my my spectrum is gotten pretty wide over the years. But yeah, I draw. I do I do comics. And, and cartoons, but I also do more serious illustrations as well. A, a little bit of everything. Awesome. And our special guest, Terry? I'm Terry. I run Jurassic Park Legacy, and I also do a paleontology blog on Tumblr on the site. Awesome, guys. So uh, I think today's topic is uh, Jurassic World. <laughs> Jurassic uh, <laughs> World. Dun, dun, dun. A whole hour. Mm supposed to be the great comeback child, the prodigy, but so far... I could live with the chaos effect thing, I could, but the tame dinosaur thing is just hell no. Oh, no. The chaos effect effect thing is totally nuts, though, I I will say that. I'd rather have it for a television show rather than a movie. Yeah, same. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's, it's, the... the Chaos Effect thing is more like a monster of the week sort of thing, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah, that's what I view it. And from what I remember, the case, Chaos Effect toy line wasn't as popular as the rest of the toy line, so I don't know why they would be going with that anyway. Because Trevorrow <laughs> is trying to play on nostalgia. Hmm. <sighs> I guess. Thus, Nublar, which should be be dead as a doornail. Oh, yeah. Right. If I may interject, if he wants to play on nostalgia, why doesn't he just make T-Rex the main villain instead of this new D-Rex thing? Because, you know, how T-Rex has been the poster boy for Jurassic Park for, like, two movies. Lizard, peace. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm just going to... I informed the audience of what the leaks were, so, uh, spoiler alert. So if you yep, don't want to hear any of Spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, the leaks, from what I remember, was there was going to be tame dinosaurs run by Chris Pratt's character, <laughs> and they would be fighting against the, quote, bad dinosaurs. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of stir on that. Um, that was the major thing that I'm puzzled about. It sounds like Pokesaurs. <laughs> That'll be the new dub in the fandom whenever I make the ruin forever thing on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> T-Rex, oh, I choose you. Man. <laughs> oh man. Te- yeah. Technically, we already have the Poke sources if you count the JP Builder game. Yeah. That's yeah. True. That's true. Oh wow! Plot twist: Jurassic World is a movie version of JP Builder. <laughs> <laughs> there you oh, go. Man. <laughs> it was, it oh, was man. in front of us all along. <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey guys, me and Marty were talking and joking around, and he was saying that the Diabolus Rex reminded him of Diablo from uh, Primal Carnage, and I made a joke saying, what if, uh, 
Jurassic Primal Rage. Yeah, Primal Rage excuse me, Primal Carnage. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I was saying, um, what if uh Jurassic World was actually like some kind of a, a, a build up movie to um Primal Rage to where it's like <laughs> we start making all these hybrid dinosaurs and they just go too crazy and then they take over the world and like enslave people because they evolved to be intelligent and all that fun stuff. You know it probably is. <laughs> so it'll be Primal Rage then. <laughs> Yep. Oh, yep. This yeah. doesn't even sound like Jurassic Park anymore. It sounds like Primal Rage <laughs> combined with Dino Riders or something. <laughs> hey, Dino Riders. You know I, because I, I usually don't like to spoil myself, but I do make an exception with some things. Like when I avoided everyone like the plague when, when Godzilla was released in theaters and everyone was talking about it. I, I avoided everyone as much as I could because I just I hate spoilers, but I made an exception for Jurassic World because, you know, the fourth Jurassic Park movie is something we've been waiting for, you know, for years, you know, as, as a fandom, yeah. you know. And yeah. to be perfectly honest, you know, I won't deny that I kind of gave up hoping for it, you know, after a while. I want to say, you know, it was around 2012, I was finally like, you know, threw my hands up and say, well, this movie's never happening, you know, and all of a sudden right. it happens. Um, and at first I was really excited with the direction it was going. Um, I'd never heard of Colin Trevorrow, of course. Um, I don't know, I don't know how well known he was before. Yeah, but, I, I think he um, only directed one movie. A documentary. So, and you know, he's... Yeah. Right, yeah. So, you know, not not a very well-known, but I was like, well, okay, you know, he might give us, you know, a fresh take on the franchise, and, you know, he might be able to kind of help resurrect it a bit after the development hell it went through. Um, and then the new logo came out, and then it was retitled, or officially given the title Jurassic World, and... You know, I kind of liked the look of the new logo, and I, I you know, the, the title had to grow on me a little bit, but I, 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 I did eventually come to appreciate it. Um, and then there was a, a period where we didn't really hear much about it, um, but then all of a sudden there's all these spoilers, which, which I, I suppose have been verified, um, and... This is just this is just hearsay, but I was told that uh, it was Jurassic Park Legacy that did some digging to verify the the rumors. Is that correct, TJ? Yeah, that was. Okay, so so as far as anyone's concerned, they they aren't rumors. They're definitely plot details, right? Yeah. From well, it's we've got a source that we've been talking to. They're also the ones that provided us with the maps as well. Oh, yeah. So, mm. you know, everything is kind of just coming out, and we're going, oh, boy, we're supposed to right. cover this piece of crap? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, a little this bit blunt. Cuttlefish snake. I know, I probably I, You know, I, I do need to say something. I probably shouldn't judge the movie before I see it. But from what I'm hearing of it, I just don't like yeah. the direction. It sounds like a 12 year old or 8 year old came up with the plot. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. Now, now if I hate I'm to correct, say that too, but. Yeah. This, new, this new Diabolic. What, what, what is it called Diabolus. again? Diabolus Rex or something? Diabolus yeah. Rex. Yeah. yeah, Diabolus Rex or yeah. whatever. If I'm correct, it's supposed to be a hybrid between a few different animals um, and have the ability to camouflage, right? Yeah, right. it's a cuttlefish, snake, T-Rex, and raptor hybrid. Which I don't Could, get why okay. they couldn't have gone with Car Carnotaurus. Exactly. Yes. Oh, that is exactly what I was thinking. Well, actually, it's and never really been about that. everyone should know this by that. now, but just in case... What it's do always you mean? been hybrids. It's always been about hybrids. Ever since this, uh, the Cell script, there was a uh, rhino and a dinosaur hybrid, human-dinosaur hybrids, and now there's a hybrid in Jurassic World. Well, you, also something, too, that you got to take into account that Jurassic Park's dinosaurs aren't real dinosaurs by nature. Exactly. They're true recreations of what InGen thought dinosaurs were at the time. 
True. However, they did want him to make it as accurate as possible. Yeah, they did. And not monstrosities of nature. Right. And originally, that's what they wanted, but now that science has changed I, yeah. and our understanding... Yeah, paleontology, it, it has our understanding, you know, it has advanced beyond... To where Jurassic Park, I think, it, it's not so much a representation of paleontology, but it's, it's more of a statement of, you know, of that era, of our understanding oh, yeah. of dinosaurs, you know? Yeah. So, and I, I think, you know, um, as much as people don't like Jurassic Park 3, I do like, um, I do like the... The saying um, Alan Grant um, has from that film where he said that, you know, that the dinosaurs of Jurassic Park, you know, are nothing more, nothing less than um, genetically engineered monsters, basically, you know, just created for entertainment, you know, and he I was think just a butthurt paleontologist. He, he was, but I, <laughs> at the same time, I think, I think that was, I, I feel like that was the filmmaker's way of. Um, kind of amending the the message of Jurassic Park. That's what I feel like. Yeah, I don't know if you guys get that same impression. No, I get that. that You just cleared it up. (laughs) You cleared it up for me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, from from the first film, we all know definitely that their main deal in designing the dinosaurs was not accuracy. Of course, you can look at the sketches and concept art. They did try to amp up the looks, make it look cooler, some of them, and stuff like that. And, But behavior-wise, yeah, they did try to make them as realistic as possible. But then they kind of they never really tried to make them more accurate looking as the movies, as more movies and films came out. They just tried to they tried, I guess, with the third film, with the Raptors, but that didn't really work out. And they're definitely not really doing anything in Jurassic World, apparently. No feathers. Well, and now the feather Nazis have uh, have something to go on now, because if they can make a hybrid animal like that, there's no reason to not include feathers. That's yeah. true. Well, see, you I know, guess. The whole right. no. I don't think they have a place in JP. I personally don't think they do. But there's no excuse anymore, I don't think. Well, you got to consider, too, at the same time, being angry with Jurassic Park because the dinosaurs don't have feathers is like being angry with Star Wars for having explosions in space. That's what I like, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a really yeah, good think... analogy. It was a good analogy. I worked yeah, hard. I... <laughs> 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 Yeah. To be honest, I used to be I used to think along the lines of wishing Jurassic Park, you know, that that, that a newer film, you know, like like at the time, you know, the hypothetical fourth film would kind of amend the general public's understanding of giant dinosaurs for a new generation, but at the same time, I'm a firm believer in um maintaining canonicity. And, oh, yeah. um, you know, it's just, that's what I feel. I feel like when, when the announcement was made that there was going to be no, I guess as far as you can call a post on Twitter an announcement, but, um, as far as, as far as that was concerned regarding, you know, the whole announcement that there were not going to be any feather dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, or in Jurassic World, rather, um, I feel like that was Trevorrow trying to um, maintain that canonicity. And that that only helps reinforce my faith in his ability to make an honest um, reboot of the franchise. Um, is Jurassic even World in, a reboot, or is it a sequel? Because I've, I've, well, I've heard it's well, I'm, not... Well, I'm using reboot in the sense that um, it's just kind of giving the franchise a breath of new life. It's still canon, you know. Um, a soft reboot. I guess it just yeah, it's a comes soft down reboot. to uh, kind of semantics. So, But re- 
um, you know, revival, I guess you could say, you know, because the Jurassic Park franchise has been, um, you know, down in the dirt long enough to where this new movie is canon, and it is a sequel, but it's also rebooting the franchise. Okay, yeah, I see what you mean. So just kind of kind of revitalizing it, just kind of bringing it out of the ashes. Yeah, it, yeah. Back. Like, in my opinion, I think, is it, hey, Terry, is it, um, is it still Engine running Jurassic World? Do you guys know yet? Oh, uh, it's Patel Corp. Oh, it's another corporation. But, okay, so, why but, not Biosyn? But, we did get a fo- sneak photo from someone on the set with a Engine chopper. Mm-hmm. So take from that what you will. Why couldn't okay. it be Biosyn? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I've like had that question for 20 us. years, why it couldn't be Biosyn. I've wanted Biosyn from the beginning, Dogsyn and all of that. Yeah. You could do so much with Biosyn. You could. Because I was thinking, since it's another corporation apparently taking Jurassic Park or World into their own hands, it's basically a reboot in that sense, but at the same time, it's not only they're redoing Jurassic Park, but it's in the same universe as the other three films. That's what I w- That's how I look at it, if that's how it is, actually. Yep. Um, I do want to say something at least positive about Jurassic World right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what about Mosasaur <gasps> being included? That's actually, you know, yeah, that was even though I'm map. not the biggest, yeah, even though I'm not the biggest, like, I don't give a crap much about marine reptiles being in Jurassic Park. It is pretty interesting, and I do want to see it. If, I, honestly, my feelings about Jurassic World is that it's like, I'm not sure exactly how how good the story will be executed, but I actually do really like the concept of having a park that actually works. I think that's something that, everybody who's a fan of Jurassic Park was at least curious about, like, how the park would actually be if, you know, all the shenanigans yeah. didn't happen and, you know, if Nedry didn't mess up and, like, the park actually was stable enough to um, clear the inspections and go public. Like, it, uh, it would just be genuinely interesting to see something like that. And I'm hoping that when Jurassic World does come, that we we get to see like you know at least a little bit of a day in the life of that park, so we could see like what it's like before it goes into chaos and and all the bad dinosaurs start you know spreading all their mojo <laughs> around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the new park isn't a deal breaker. It's just the way it's got to be executed. Right. right now, it doesn't seem like it's going to be that great, considering he's also a newbie director. I honestly kind of like, I got kind of excited when I saw the maps and all, all those pictures of the maps because I got excited because it looks just like, you know, like a SeaWorld park map or a zoo map. It, I feel like, holy crap, this is really happening. It feels like a real thing that could happen in our world. So that's what got me excited. I am actually, no, I actually like it. I no dialo, no deal. <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind, too that, um, uh, what's his name, Gareth Edwards, um, you know, director of Godzilla 2014. Yeah. Um, his debut film was, he, he's only, he, he, he also has only directed one film before taking on a big name. Um, and of course, his, his debut film um, which was Monsters, was was fantastic. And it was, you know, it was a demonstration of a unique ability to, um, you know, he basically did the whole film, you know, everything from the directing and the editing, you know, to the, the casting animating. and and yeah. animating. I mean, he did, he did it all himself as an indie director. And, you know, people recognized that talent. And, you know, he got... He got signed on to do Godzilla, and of course, Godzilla is is an amazing movie, and I'm sure there's a minority that disagrees with me. But I think generally, I mean, it, you know, destroyed the box office. So um, I think that goes. <laughs> oh yeah. To, I think that goes well, to say not. how, um, you know, how much potential there is in a new director. You know what I'm saying? 
So even with these rather sketchy <laughs> sketchy plot details that we've gotten, I am still willing to give Colin Trevorrow a chance, you know. Well, well, that, I'm willing it's a to give him point. a chance, too, so long as he doesn't screw up the continuity. Yeah. It's just, I've watched Safety, and it's not the greatest film. It's not, the, it's not that good of a film, no, in my no. own opinion. So that it just raises a red flag for me. Safety oh, it's is... it's true, I haven't seen... Safety Not Guaranteed is basically a mediocre film at best. I mean, the only reason why it gets a pass is because it was an indie. Exactly. That's what I've been saying on the forums. Yeah. It didn't resolve all the storylines or anything like that. It just went, okay, uh, time travel did it before. Okay, oops. No, I didn't do it before, but I'm doing it now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's Yeah. Yeah, so, I, so for that's, that's, a general synopsis of the movie, because I haven't seen it, what it's it's about time travel, you said? Yeah. yeah. Basically, this guy file, files an ad in the paper that says, need a companion for time travel. I have only done this once before. That That portion is never addressed <laughs> ever again. You find out that the girl that he saved is alive. But he didn't even he didn't even say that he time traveled to go back and fix it. The whole m- movie leading up to that at that point is to go back to save the girl. Hmm. It's just so, it doesn't it doesn't jive well. Truly a mediocre film. Yeah, you just gotta watch it. It's just um, got a it's just got a big pl- gaping hole in. The yeah, it's just funny, right? And it's okay. okay. It's fun. Don't think about, if you Fred's don't outlook on life. If you if you <laughs> don't think about it, it makes sense. But if you do think about it, it doesn't make sense. Right. Yeah. Speaking of things that don't make sense, how how are you guys feeling about Spinosaurus and the Jurassic Park uh, franchise? Like, do you guys expect it to return in Jurassic World? And if it does, do you think it'll play an important role, or do you think he'll kind of be sort of pushed aside a little bit? I would like to see Spinosaurus back. I don't think he should be a major role, but they should acknowledge him in some way. They probably will. Agreed. We'll, we'll probably see a little kid pointing at it in the cage, and he's probably going to be all pissed off because he's not in the lead role. Mommy, giant mutant dog! <laughs> <laughs> he's so, probably going to yeah. be pouting in the corner. I should have been the main role. <laughs> I would like to see Spinosaurus return, just because you know it is part of the franchise now, and I think I think if it if it had another appearance, it would give the audience a chance to see it in a new light, you know, not as not as a really contrived adversary to T Rex, but as as a character in its own right, you know. I think That's this is I a great see. opportunity to uh, to showcase new behaviors in these animals. Oh yeah. Like, um, what David was saying about the Dilophosaurus as an alternative to the big bad dinosaur. Oh, oh boy, do I get to start talking about this? Oh, yeah, man. Let it go. (laughs) I'll I'll post post a picture up here, too. Okay, um, so I I got an interesting idea for a Dilophosaurus to return to the Jurassic Park franchise in a way that's much different than its original uh, depiction in the first movie. Um, We all know that in the first movie, Dilophosaurus is puny, playful, and in most general aspects, inaccurate to the real thing. But I started thinking, what if the Dilophosaurus had some extreme sexual dimorphism? If anyone's familiar with fish, Rick might be... Rick might be on the same page as me. There's a kind of fish called a sockeye salmon. And during the breeding season, the males actually mutate. And the, the shape of their skulls changes. And it, get, it gets a very hook-like shape. Honestly, um, I, I could probably like find a link or something with an image of it. But the, the face of a male sockeye salmon honestly looks like a sucomimus. Like, it is really wicked. It's got this, this curved hook-like jaw and these teeth that just protrude out from it. And it uses this new... Uh, yeah. Design. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, Rick's familiar. I was thinking, what if um, in Jurassic World, 
they had male Diophosaurus start appearing, and they would have this as a, uh, like, first of all, their face would look more accurate to the real dinosaur, but, like, it would be sort of salmon DNA or something mixed in with it that would make uh, a male's change like that. So they're, uh, they would have the more accurate skull, and the uh, behavior would be different because they'd be, like, sort of breeding males. They'd be extremely aggressive and just generally dangerous. Like, I was... Uh, I was saying that it would actually make Dolphosaurus a very uh, dangerous animal in the park, and seeing as, you know, they're bigger than raptors and they have a whole, like, poisonous spit and stuff, like, they'd be pretty pr pretty uh, hard to deal with in, in those cases. Like, because um, uh, we've seen the old um, paintings of the Dolphosaurus doing the sort of kangaroo kick, like, jumping back and, like, you know, by lashing out with his claws, I, I feel like the Dolphosaurus would actually be a very formidable fighter of a dinosaur. Like, most of the dinosaurs are sort of depicted to be, like, you know, like, dangerous and to kill you, but you don't really see a whole lot of actual fighting going on. And I was thinking that a male Dolphosaurus, its, it's main business in life was to defeat all competition for the type of many mates as possible. I think an animal like that in Jurassic World would be very problematic, especially if it managed to, you know, severely injure handlers and get out of its pen and start, you know, going around attacking people. Um, you know, yeah. I actually like that idea. Oh, right, man, I, the way he said it, though, I just feel so pumped. <laughs> well, just imagine if a Dilophosaurus came up to a raptor, shot out its frill, and just started, like, screaming you at it. You know what? I'll make see, a animation off of that. Like, maybe you will. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've always wanted to see that. Yeah, because, guys, the way I feel is that it's like, first of all, Dolphosaurus is probably one of the most memorable dinosaurs in the entire franchise. Everyone remembers oh, yeah. the Dolphosaurus. It's the most neglected as well. Yes. It, ha it got oh. no screen time. I honestly wish yeah. that the Rattus from Jurassic Park 3 would have been Dilophosaurus because it had such a shoo-in role. I think it would have been nice to pay to uh, pay homage to the first film by having, you know, the little spitter come up to the guys while they're digging around in the Spinosaurus copper lights. <laughs> See what I did there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, I, I think it would have been really cool to have the Dilophosaurus come up and then have some of the characters, like, say something witty and, you know smart and funny to it and then have it not attack them and have that kind of be like a joke that parallels to how Nedry was speaking to the Dilophosaurus in the first film and kind of have like a little a little bit of a gag there saying that like well maybe if you be nice to them they won't kill you you know like, <laughs> like I feel like they could have they could have done more of that scene and I actually really miss the Dilophosaurus as a character I, I would like to see it come back and um I I totally agree with you, um, and that's actually a really cool idea, and it does make sense, um, especially I like what you suggested with the whole, you know, spliced with salmon DNA thing, too, um, because, of course, with, with the whole notched jaw, Dilophosaurus kind of fits that profile anyway, um, but, of course... Um, you know, even what we were saying earlier about, um, you know, how the original film... Um, tried to kind of amend society's understanding of dinosaurs and, you know, kind of pushed, um, you know, some new concepts a little more to try and make it more accurate, you know, especially with alluding um, raptor dinosaurs to, to birds and everything like that, which Alan Grant did. Um, but at the end of the day, they were all still mutants because they were all still modified with um, frog DNA. You know, so from, from the very, very beginning... Um, you know, they could still do do abilities. They still had abilities that were unnatural, you know, as far as we know, you know, for, for those dinosaurs. And it must have been every dinosaur had the ability to change genders, um, you know, from, their, from that frog DNA, because obviously all the dinosaurs the park created reproduced. Um, so they were all mutated to a degree, and we know they were mutated to a degree. So for there, have, for there to have been other, um, other, other animals' genes used to fill in some of the gaps for some of the other dinosaurs, I think it's, it's a very plausible stretch, um, like with 
salmon DNA in Dilophosaurus, or even I always like to imagine that the Dilophosaurus was actually spliced with um, frilled lizard DNA just because of its whole frill thing. So that's just kind of as a as a fan, that's just kind of one of my own fan explanations for the frill, you know, that it was spliced with. Um, you know, so that's that's what I think about it. And, of course, you know, we're skeptical about the whole, you know, Diabolus Rex, you know, with all that spliced DNA. But, you know, it, it could turn out bad, but at the same time, it could it could um, do justice to the whole concept of oh. genetic engineering that Jurassic Park has focused largely on. So, I don't know. Um... Let's see. Um, speaking of the Diabolus Rex, honestly, I still am in favor of Carnotaurus, and I remember talking about it in a previous uh, Skype conversation. I think that Carnotaurus would actually be a really um, interesting and uh, actually genuinely scary dinosaur to have on film because of its ability to camouflage. I know um, the Carnotaurus has always been compared to a chameleon instead of a cuttlefish, but either way, I still think it'd be just so formidable because um, it, it's appeared in, like, the Jurassic Park arcade game and, like, the Lost World books. Apparently, the camouflage is so good that it can pretty much become invisible, and I was... And, um, I imagine that in Jurassic World, that would just be so cool to see because I figure when the Carnotaurus is, you know, closing in on someone, attacking them, they can't see it until it opens its mouth. So all they see is the inside of the mouth and the teeth just appear, you know, from thin air in front of them, like, you know, starts biting onto them. Have you guys ever seen that movie called, like, Hollow Man or whatever, about, like, the invisible dude going around attacking people? Like, I've never seen it, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, like, like, um, like, I think the 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 um, camouflage Carnotaurus would just be such a cool creature. I I don't I don't really understand why they would uh, like opt for something else instead of doing the Carnotaurus. <laughs> I don't Honestly, see what you're talking like, about. Well, because, um, right, go ahead. Uh, because like, I remember another thing with the Carnotaurus, like the sort of main weakness of it being that it uses its environment to create these invisibility patterns, but it's like it's literally just changing the pigment of its skin. The way the park rangers could handle the creature is that they would shine bright lights on it, and when the, the light like reflects off their scales, it allows them to see an outline, an impression of the creature, so they, so they, can, they can track it and see where it's going. And I think that that would just be such a visually impressive thing to add to Jurassic World. And I I um I don't know how they're going to handle this D-Rex, but I think if they really try the Carnotaurus, they could have something extremely cool. I'll let somebody else talk now. Yeah. Um, what do you think about um, Diabolus Rex versus Carnotaurus, Terry? And or Dilo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you even have to... I think you guys already know the answer to this. <laughs> we just sure. hear it. Just say it to, uh, for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Carnotaurus I'd prefer because at least it would actually make another connection to the novel. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Personally, do you know what I would actually like? I'd like if the whole, thi whole thing was just thrown out. And they remade the movies scientifically accurate, based entirely scene for scene off the novels. Ultimately, that's what I would want too. Yeah. Um, that's I've I've been thinking about that for a while myself, you know, and kind of wishing they just remake the franchise, you know, more true to the novels. Um, especially, and here's, I don't want to rant too much, give you guys no time to talk or anything, but, um, <laughs> what I think, what I think about the whole Jurassic Park franchise is that, um, Steven Spielberg has a tendency to, um, implement or dumb down themes in his stories to make them more kid-friendly, um, and I think I think it 
it may have actually detracted a bit from Michael Crichton's original um, message with Jurassic Park um, right. by Steven Spielberg doing yep. that. For example, um, I'm sure we're all aware that um, in the original novel, um, there was a scene where an infant was actually eaten alive by compies. Um, or whatever they were in the novel. I forget what they were, but they were pro the equivalent. Pro comps pro, yeah. Yeah, pro okay, yeah, they were pro comps Ignatius in the novel. <clears throat> They're also uh, ven venomous, from what I remember. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. And um, it was not... in None of Crichton's books are intended to be, you know, family-friendly. And at the same time, all of his books... Um, they also all have a lot to do with man tampering with, with nature and kind of warning us about, you know, those, those boundaries. And um, the whole point of Jurassic Park was that, um, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't screw with nature like that because it's beyond our control. And, you know, and I think the original film did convey that message fairly well. But I think... Um, I just think there's a whole lot more Jurassic Park could do. As it's an iconic name, it could be made, you know. Um, I've always thought, yeah. Yeah, I always thought. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Rick, finish. Rick, finish, yeah, Rick and then Marty will go. Particularly in that, like, like Terry said, um, a Jurassic Park remake that was more consistent with modern paleontology, um, it would give a remake the capacity to um, amend our society's understanding of dinosaurs without ruining the canon, you know? Just give it a whole new canon, you know? Start fresh, you know? Give the dromaeosaurs feathers, whatever, you know? <laughs> That's what I think. Um, but of course... When is when is an ultimate remake gonna happen? You know, just kind of a fan Probably fantasy. Probably after this one flops. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. It's, it's not if, yep. it's when. Yep. Yeah, it's not if, it's it's it's, it's when. <laughs> it's probably when this one flops. You know, a uh, yeah. Years and you know. Yeah. <laughs> Get ready for the greatest dinosaur film ever made, Jurassic Park. With two depressing sequels and a failure of a reboot. <laughs> oh, God. Honest trailers, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I was I totally agree with you on the uh, JP being kind of held back by its kid-friendly nature. I really think JP could have been more violent, and it could have sent out the message a lot more, a lot more efficiently. Yeah. Or look for the right word. But. And... Um... I'll, I'll seriously stop talking, but um, I do want to <laughs> say something about about the Carnotaurus, just because um, I'm kind of with you guys, and I've always been, ever since I read um, the Lost World novel, I've always wanted to see Carn the Jurassic Park Carnotaurus, you know, on screen, and I was I was very disappointed when I heard or read rather that the um, that the new villain with camouflage abilities in Jurassic World was not a Carnotaurus, but, but you know... Just a made-up dinosaur. Just a made-up dinosaur. And it, you know, it it frustrated me a bit, because I was actually I was actually expecting the new antagonist dinosaur to be Carnotaurus. I mean, I, I, I could have bet money on it. I was... Oh, yeah. I was just so sure, you know, and... And just so for it to be for it to be a dinosaur with with a camouflage ability that isn't Carnotaurus, it just almost seems I don't know slap in the face to the fandom. Exactly. Oh, yes. it's, exactly. It's, this movie is being made for the general public. It's not being yeah. made for the fans. That's true. Yeah. True. But the general public now hates it. <laughs> Well, according to the poll on the site, there's 98 that like it and 148 that don't. So about 60, 50 maybe or something like that? 60, 40? No, I take that back. 98, 
Oh. <laughs> That's okay. more than the Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't like Pokesaurus and they don't like Chaos Effect. It just seems like really odd why they would use a made up dinosaur when we got so many, like hundreds yeah. of genre. To oh, work with. guys, speaking of which, hundreds of genre of dinosaurs. Why are they making up a new dinosaur when we have never, ever seen Metriacanthosaurus? Its name oh, yeah. is in the first movie. They they literally like put it in the middle of the screen, and everyone's like, "Oh, what's that?" They could <laughs> they could they could definitely use that in Jurassic World as this new dinosaur because last time I googled him, he looked like a dragon. This thing is pretty much like real life version of Michael Bay's Grimlock. Like they, <laughs> they could, like honestly, Metriacanthosaurus could uh. Could, could really be an interesting dinosaur to play out. And um, honestly, another dinosaur that, that would be a good villain for Jurassic World, a very good villain for Jurassic World, is Allosaurus. Yes. Because, for, first of all, he's actually a Jurassic dinosaur. And second of all, it pretty much fits the bill of what the D-Rex <laughs> is supposed to be. It's, it's a, <laughs> like, they say the D-Rex is supposed to be like a mix of a T-Rex and a raptor. So it's an Allosaurus, I guess? Like, just I'll think of it as <laughs> I'll take over this yeah. bit. <sighs> yeah, here you go, Fred. Yeah. This is your this is your area of expertise. Did you hear? Can you hear? Can you hear my cracking my knuckles? No, <laughs> no, I don't crack everything. I can't do it anymore. Yes, I've been telling ever since people have asked me when I was a kid, Fred, what's your favorite dinosaur? I've been telling them the exact same explanation all the time. It's a it's basically a mix between a raptor and a rex. Both in size, because the raptor is super small and the T-Rex is super large. So Allosaurus is in the middle, actually somewhat close to T-Rex's size. Plus, we've got three fingers on this animal with lar- long arms and large claws, unlike the T-Rex and more like the raptor. And plus, it doesn't have a hugely robust head as a T-Rex. But somewhere in between the size of a raptor and a rex. It's basically a mix of the two without the killing claw and the very powerful bite and you know. So that like like what David said, it's a perfect (laughs) it's a perfect it's almost a perfect animal, but honestly, even though it's my favorite dinosaur, I would have preferred a Carnotaurus. I mean they could have done so much and you know, they could have the designers could have done a really creepy looking Carnotaurus because his face is already creepy, being short and and whatnot with the huge horns. They could have done so much with Carnotaurus. Yeah, um to add on to your thing about Carnotaurus, I really love the in the Jurassic Park arcade game, they gave the Carnotaurus those chameleon eyes that could swivel yes. and pivot around. That would add so much to the aesthetic of Carnotaurus. Because it it could be looking at you and like three other people at the same time, and you have no yes. idea who it's going to actually attack. I can yeah, see that's... that scene in Jurassic in Jurassic World. There's a bunch of soldiers or something going through the forest, and then it just comes out of nowhere, attacks one soldier. They're all looking around, and his camouflage fades off because he's already been spotted. So he just rears up high, lifts his head up as high as he could, and he just stares at all of them. All different, just looking at all the different ones with both his eyes in different directions, and that would be so creepy. Oh, it's just they could have done so much, so I, much. I know, Carnotaurus, you know, almost more than any other dinosaur in the whole franchise, just has so much potential. Just the way that Michael Crichton envisioned it. Yeah. And I just think it's being wasted, you know. Yeah, like it's not like they're not even acknowledging that it exists. It's actually really terrible. He only appeared in the little silly arcade game, and he was an easy boss, too. He just sits there and opens his mouth. incredibly easy. (laughs) I mean, most of the bosses on the game were really easy, but still. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Those Raptors in that game was a a big opportunity here. Yeah, they're wasting a big opportunity. And uh, honestly, like when it comes to Carnotaurus being a like a main a big player in uh, Jurassic World or just any Jurassic Parks like installment, Carnotaurus is a very well known dinosaur. Ever since Disney decided to use it as a main antagonist for their movie dinosaur, the Carnotaur has been pretty much everywhere. It's it was in Terra Nova. That show, it, like. 
Carnotaurus is just everywhere. It's such a well-known dinosaur. That's true. Like, oh, yeah, like, that's true. Like, honestly, because, like, Allosaurus is very well-known, but Carnotaurus has, is a seasoned veteran dinosaur for popular culture. It, it would make no... It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, you know, deny this creature. It's pretty much the devil of dinosaurs. And, uh, it's yeah. just, like, it... it it works aesthetically, and the version that Michael Crichton came up with is a gold mine of potential that they're just not um, exploiting. Which it should be the I wish that they would because it, it's Crichton's original novels were intended, and in going back to what we were talking about earlier, how they've been watered down for the general public and made mm-hmm. kid friendly, is that he intended his work to be adult dinosaur novels right. for mm-hmm. adults. Basically. Right, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's just being held back. The films are being held back by their kid-friendly nature. Yeah. I think they should be taken more seriously. Because it's about genetic tampering. It should be taken way more serious than it is. And it, 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 Especially because it is a Even very a controversial um, ethical subject, you know? That right. I think, I think Michael Crichton investigated that subject very thoughtfully, and it's just been, um, you know, trampled on. Restating you guys, but <laughs> you know, um, yeah. To add to that, yeah, um, it, I, I f- sorry for interrupting, Rick, but I feel like the sort of the the moral and ethical message of Jurassic Park is completely missed in the films because the main thing you have about these these dinosaurs is yes they are a danger to people and you know they do kill people a lot but at the same time the deeper message to Jurassic Park in my interpretation is that man has played god and created life and now the question is what do like how do we deal with this these new life forms it's like do they have have rights of their own, or are they like our property? Exactly. Like that, that deep stuff, because it's like that's it's the, yeah, like, exactly. That's yep. something that and never gets brought up at all. Because well, actually, it did. Jurassic Park: The Game. The character Laura Sorkin, who was like you well, know the psychopath, she she brought that theme up. Actually, I, I will say capacity in in the second loss in the second Jurassic Park film to a point. Yeah, that's, yeah, they that's did bring what it I up. was going to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, it should have been a sequel dealing with this instead of the new part. <sighs> I feel like they could have done a lot with the ethics of it. Yeah. And Terry's, Terry's right, and that's basically what I was going to say is that the Lost World Jurassic Park did investigate that, that <clears throat> concept a little bit. Because um, when you look at all three films... Um, I think the first one does a pretty good job of um, conveying the message that the original novel did, um, you know, that man should, you know, be very careful in tampering with nature. And the second film, you know, was about dealing with the consequences of tampering with nature. And, you know, I I really loved... um, I'd say personally for that reason, The Lost World Jurassic Park is my favorite of the trilogy. Um, Agreed. You know, just because, first of all, I, there's no movie scene I love more than Mama's Angry, but that's, <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> um, we agree there. But that line, um, it, just, you know, it just made the whole audience go, oh, I know, right? <laughs> there needs to be more of that in JP. Oh yeah, I know. It, it was just one of those one of those intense oh crap moments that just I just love that scene. I really I think, do. I think one of the last things I'm gonna say is that uh, I think Dave, when David talked about how having the Carnotaurus camouflage Carnotaurus be the main villain, it would be kind of a nod to the to the first film if they. If one of the if this animal was running around reaping havoc near the end of the film, and then one of the people, one of the workers or one of the main characters, ran off and they asked him, "Where are you going?" And then he or she says, "I have an idea." And 
a few minutes later, out of nowhere, right before someone else gets killed, the T-Rex comes in and just demolishes the Carnotaurus. That would be like kind of a nice nod, but I know that's too much like the first film, but it's kind of a cool idea in my opinion. Well, when you think about it, and this is another this is another reason I absolutely love Carnotaurus as my favorite of the Jurassic Park dinosaurs, is if you remember in the original Lost World novel, um, it was the bad boy of, of the island. Um, the Velociraptors oh, yeah. wouldn't go into the compound where it was. The T Rex wouldn't even go into the compound where it was. It would. Oh, it, I mean, it, it would, but it would only. Have you never read the novel, Fred? The no, I've never oh, read yeah, the was, novel. Everyone was scared yet. of that thing. Oh well. Um. Okay. So I'm spoiling it a little bit for you. No, but, no, no. <laughs> I want to hear it anyway. <laughs> but the T Rex wouldn't even go in there. Um, I think the T Rex. There was one scene where the T Rex. Um ran into the compound really quick, um, defecated on um, <laughs> on something, and my phone is ringing, um, but um, defecated on something and then ran re- ran out really fast because just nothing messed with the Carnotaurs on Isla Sorna, and that was just so awesome to me. Like, they were the things, you know, oh, yeah. the beasts. Uh, it was a it was a night scene when they found Carnotaurus. Yeah, right? it was. Oh man, you could, oh, so want to direct a scene like that, man. I know. So much potential. So much potential. We're gonna be going on about this all <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, uh, we don't have much to talk more about Jurassic World. So, last opinions, thoughts before we wrap it up. I guess I'm going to just wait and wait and see what happens before and give it a chance when it comes into theaters and everything else. I'm not going to, and if it flops, it flops. And yep. then I'm just going to be like, okay, that's that. Yep. I'll copy totally the agree. encyclopedia and everything will be hunky dory. I agree yeah, with Jerry. I'm, I, I just, I'm a dinosaur fan. I love dinosaurs, even though they might screw up the story. But I still look forward to this movie very much. I mean, some of the ideas are great. The main idea is pretty bad, but I'm still going to enjoy it. I don't know. I mean, I enjoyed all three the first films. I'm going to enjoy this one. But hmm. let's just see. Maybe. Maybe the Carnotaurus will be one of the tame dinosaurs. And <laughs> it will, oh, no. it will be the climax scene where it no. comes out and takes the Diabolus Rex by surprise. That would be so the only worthy opponent <laughs> to this camouflage mutant dinosaur. Oh no! <laughs> no, I could no. see the hatchery doors Come on, lowered. Guys. Give Come me on. The Jurassic World sequel. I love Let's Carno, but no. <laughs> it's become the Godzilla of Jurassic Park. Yo, you mean Spino? Yeah. Oh, I don't want that to happen. No, <laughs> no, no, I. Uh, I, I, I honestly, I, I wouldn't let myself, I wouldn't let myself do that to the film. <laughs> I'm going to be crying inside the theater and say, they, they ruined it, the son of a bitches, they ruined it. <laughs> I just thought it was, it was too funny an idea to not mention, so. Oh, <laughs> yeah, speaking of, uh, we are running out of time with the whole Jurassic World thing, but yeah, Marty using the word ruin reminds me. If Velociraptor ends up being one of these tame dinosaurs, I'm going to oh, have please, a problem. No. Because the, the, the Velociraptor embodies the whole don't screw with nature theme, and the fact that they are so wildly unpredictable and intelligent, so good at killing people, having them be tame is just a complete kick in the stomach for the franchise. It shoot itself in the foot doing that. At least I there'll agree. be merchandise. <laughs> I mean, that's part <laughs> of like the main, the main reason the whole plot like this. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, can see the ads I on agree. TV already. I, I will always wear my Jurassic Park cap proudly. I will always wear my Jurassic Park T-shirt proudly. I will always drive around my Jurassic Park decal laden truck proudly. But you know, hey. Jurassic, Jurassic Park, Park is cool. Will Jurassic always World be sucks. Jurassic yeah. Park to me, and, you know, Jurassic World <laughs> won't change that. So, no matter yep. how good it is or how bad it is, you know, Jurassic Park will still stand on its own. And I am an undying Jurassic Park fan, you know. 
Yeah. Regardless of Jurassic World. Yep, I'm pretty sure right. that as fans, we're all going to go see the movie and we're all going to support it. If we end up liking it in the end or not, that's that's not really up to us. <laughs> it's just a matter of how they do it. But, I mean, we can all guarantee the audience that we'll be there in theaters when it's out. What is my keyboard? Yeah, no doubt we're all going to see it. So, um, I think that was a good discussion for Dress World. Now, uh... We're on to dinosaur feeding uh, behaviors. Oh, cool. We're talking about this today. Dinosaur feeding behaviors. Should we uh, bring up a therizinosaur theories? Well, um, hypothesis? let's kind so of... it does tie in. Let's kind of give our audience some, some background on this discussion. Um, before, before we decided to do a podcast, um, the four of us would get together... Um, and we had a few interesting discussions on um, various ideas we had regarding um, dinosaur feeding behaviors. And um, we wanted to allow some time for that tonight um, because we, I think we, we all have a lot to say on it. I know especially, um, especially whoever came up with the whole thing about Therizinosaurus, but I, I guess I'll let... I'll let you get into that, Marty, since you're kind of the catalyst of that discussion. Yeah, what we basically, I think it was pretty much all of us, but we all came up with a separate thing. Like, I think David came up with the honey uh, tree sap eating. Fred came up with the more panda-ish sort of evolution with there's and in the eater stores. stuff, too, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, we kind of all came up with, like, anteater kind of style. And I, I drew an image of a uh, bipisaurus digging through a termite mound, and just this, it has really long skulls. You know, I would think maybe it's, it has a really long tongue to go through like termite mas- nests. Who 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 knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the whole thing I mean, was that therizinosaurs are so weird, and none of us agreed with. Um, any of the theories that had been proposed. So we all came up with our own, basically. Well, it just seems sort of weird how all of a sudden these animals grew such long necks in upright posture, long arms and very long claws. Obviously, they're doing something that no other dinosaur is doing. Yeah. I don't buy the whole, oh, they use the claws to bring tree branches near them, because why would they use the, why would they evolve a long neck then? Yeah, that's kind of... My same thoughts, too. To add to this discussion, um, what I was thinking with the Therizinosaurus was that they do have the long claws to uh, break apart termite mounds or, or like, um, or like, um, like dig up, like, um, nests of, like, ants and termites, creatures of that nature. I was thinking that perhaps their neck was so long because they, they have adapted this to actually reach their head into the ground after they, or, or into, like, a nest or hive or something after they've, you know, like, pretty much disemboweled it so they can do so. They would, yeah. they would like, snake, like, snake their head into whatever hole or, or, like, like, um, like opening they've created and they would just you know eat at their leisure um we since they're sort of cretaceous dinosaurs um i'm not sure about my taxonomy right now but i believe they're like somewhere in upper manoraptor you know those sort of feathery coelurosaur based dinosaurs they probably did have extensive feathers on their bodies and i believe that um like I, I think of the therizinosaurus to be kind of like honey badgers, and if they have a lot of like you know like feathery uh, down on their head to protect their faces, they would be able to go in and just feed on like you know like termites or like bees and things like that, like these insects, and just like completely um, raid their nests without fear of being stung or bitten. Right. Right. And of course the whole analogy is um you know ant eaters use their 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 intense claws to break apart um and, and bears too with with um beehives and stuff all these different animals use their their claws to break apart these different structures to access the food inside and then in the case of ant eaters they have they have long snouts that they can reach in um without, you know, really obstructing any 
anything and 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 and, and, and long tongues additionally you know so that they can they can really get in there and get at those ants and i think that's kind of where our idea with the combination of big claws and a long neck in Therizinosaurus is to kind of kind of like the the dinosaurian equivalent to ant eaters almost or you know honey eaters or however you look at it you know they could have been opportunistic too maybe they maybe they would have dined on all varieties of of food sources from ants to termites to honey who knows to add to what rick is saying um uh, what was i about to say damn it um ah. any better don't care <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man, I just forgot what I was saying because my keyboard was doing something weird and I had to fix it. Ah, skip me. Whatever. I'll, it'll come back to me. Now, Fred, I know you had you had some good some good drawings and some good ideas too. Do you want to elaborate on 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 your uh, opinions a little more regarding Theros and the Source? Why? Thank you, Rick. Um. Yeah, because. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said, good, you said they were good drawings, so I was like, oh, well, thank you. You're welcome. They are good drawings. Anyway, like... thank you. So, Agreed. what I'm not, um, I'm kind of disagreeing with Marty on the plant idea because, I mean, they could have been omnivorous and. And that could have been one of... (laughs) (laughs) You're not my friend anymore. No, but it could have been an option for their diet, you know. And we don't know what exactly they were eating, so we can't really cancel that out 100%, of course. But maybe they were... Maybe they ate a bit of everything, but mostly insects. Yeah, I did come up... Kind of come up with the anteater idea. And in fact, I colored it just like an anteater and then when I looked back in these photos of dinosaurs that I download there was an older drawing done by a friend of the, um, one of the artists that was working on on Dinosaur World? Revolution and he was working on the Disney's dinosaur movie too and he drew Therizinosaurus exactly like a um, anteater as well really? just like the African ant oh, no. just I, like that I with the same color but about, not, uh, not with the same not with feathers or anything I think you're talking about Wayne Barlow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, that. Yeah. So what do you think about this, TJ? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of... I don't know. I mean... It's a lot to take in. Yeah, it's out there. It's so, know, rad- it it's so out radical. It's so radical. Yeah. My my thing is, is I'm kind of hardcore that they're herbiv- herbivorous. Yeah. Herbivores, okay. so I just yeah, it's pretty out there. I mean, the ants, yeah, it, the termite thing doesn't have to be some pretty darn big ants and termites. True. You know, well, because I mean, yeah. looking at the size of Therizinosaurus itself, I don't think Therizinosaurus itself would have been that way, but I think uh, smaller animals like Bipisaurus might have been. Yeah, but then I again. Mean, I can see that to a point. I could. Yeah. But I just, I don't know, I kind of want some hard evidence for it. Yeah. Yeah, but then another thing was that, sorry Rick, but I was going to just say something real quick. Because remember that the, I think the oxygen levels were higher back then, am I right? So then, wouldn't the insects be larger than they are today? So then that would mean there would have been a lot larger and more bugs, right? I do know oxygen does take a play into bug size, but I'm not sure on that. Well, I just yeah, thought um, about that either. I'm not sure what the oxygen levels, because I know, obviously, well, because there's the Carboniferous, obviously. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, scientific evidence from Carboniferous layers suggests that, you know, the the plants and animals from from those layers lived in an oxygen environment that was much much richer than our own and modern today um the oxygen level the atmospheric oxygen levels are about 21% i believe in today's atmosphere yeah. and they were significantly higher um in carboniferous layers um 
So who knows really? I don't I wouldn't be able to say um what the oxygen levels were um as far as we can tell from evidence that we might have gained from from layers where dinosaurs would be found. Um so I don't I wouldn't be able to say in that regard. Um but I do know I do know that there are Permian layers where giant dragonflies um have been found in in low oxygen environments. So, and we're talking, you know, um griffin fly griffin flies, you know, like Meganeura, the big eagle-sized dragonflies of the yeah. Carboniferous. There is right. evidence that dragonflies of that size also live <laughs> in low oxygen environments. So, I believe it is possible for insects to reach a larger size than we think is possible in lower oxygen environments. Um, whether or not, you know, it, it's it's all really just wild speculation, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, speculation's good, and I I agree. It's it's good to keep in mind, but yeah, I just it's, I'm more of a person that likes to have my evidence. Yeah, extraordinary claims require yeah. extraordinary. Evidence. I mean, it was just an idea. It it is, yeah, it is just an idea, but you know, therizinosaurs have such a weird anatomy, you know. Um, right. You you really can't say you really can't say with with proof to back it up what they did eat, but at the same time you can't say with proof what they but, didn't eat. You know, because it's I don't know. Weird those animals. You'll never know. Unless we find stomach contents. Unless oh, we yeah, find coprolites true. from Therese's <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> no, no! Another name plugin. We, we, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I honestly, though, I, I I hope that happens. I hope some some hard evidence of what therizinosaurs ate, you know, whether it be stomach contents or associated coprolites, reveals what their diet actually was, and that will help us, you know, because up to this point, um, the whole you know anteater lifestyle is as much speculation as it is that they were strict herbivores. Because I, yeah, as far I agree as there. as yeah, as far as I'm aware, there's no hard evidence for what their diet was either way. So, they're just, you know, there's still a lot of mysteries, you know, and from the beginning they were weird dinosaurs, and every discovery we make just adds to their weirdness, you know, and I I want to say that their diet is going to end up being discovered to be just as weird as their appearance, you know. Um, right. You know, because the body always suits the need. But what that need is, you know... Who knows? Who knows? So, all Marty. the ideas... <laughs> oh, God, no. Oh, what? no. Don't set us off now. <laughs> I'm Please. sorry. No, but he said the body suits the needs, and I started thinking of that Dinosaur Hunter game with the Therizinosaurus. Oh no! <laughs> it's body. Don't bring uh, that up. I haven't made that yet. Be sure, oh, people geez. who all those who are listening, there will be a funny. Th- there will be an intense Thursday and a source video coming soon from Fred the Dinosaur it's, Man. Look out! Completely, completely It'll be accurate. very serious. Boring. <laughs> kind of. All right, all right. Let's let's get back to uh, the topic here. <laughs> yeah. Kind of along the that? same lines, if there is an Asaurus, um. I have to throw Dinochirus out there really quick because please do oh please please that one I that one's just gotten weirder by the day. It's and, like it's a mix of Therizinosaur, Hadrosaur, and like what? <laughs> and it, it's just like duck. What you know? What was its lifestyle? You know? Because well, it had a very flat, broad, wide. Beak. Because it also had very long, long claws. Yeah, before we knew what the head looked like, you know. Um, right. I mean, first of all, we used to only have its arms, <laughs> so I guess nobody was right. even sure what exactly it was. Um, but then now we have the body and the head, and instead of being a typical therizinosaur or a, a typical ornithomimosaur, it is 
it is still, I do believe it is still an ornithomimosaur, right? Yes. Yeah, it's it's a giant ornithomimosaur with a hump on its back and a bill like a hadrosaur. And it is just... And hands like a, <laughs> like a sukumimus I mean, or something. Yeah, I'm just going to say it is... It is weirder and more bizarre than Therizinosaurs could ever dream to be. I mean, this blows Therizinosaurs out of the water, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. I'll agree with that. And, you know, if we think it's difficult guessing what Therizinosaurus might have eaten, you know, speculating what Dinochirus might have eaten, <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's that's almost too much to wrap my mind around. But it sort of seems that they might have been similar to waterfowl, but that's just my own opinion. Where was Dino Kyrus found? Was isn't it from like Mongolia? Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. So would be more arid. What well, the frick was it doing? Because I know that. Um, you know, based on evidence of you know plant life and and different things like that from the areas these animals are found. I do believe there was there was an area um, in in Asia that, you know, most of it was, you know, like Velociraptor. I think, you know, it's pretty obvious it lived in a desert, arid kind of environment. Um, but there was, I believe, where Saurolophus lived, actually, was more swampy. Um... I remember reading something about that. So I I, I don't think every area... Um, Tarbosaurus as well. Yeah. They have a lot of tracks of that animal. So it, might, it must have been, at least partially, been a more swampy, watery area. Yeah, so I mean, it's not like... It's not like Dinochirus absolutely lived in an arid, deserty area, you know? Um... So that's our camel of a dinosaur. Yeah, basically. yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Wookie D. That's actually, you know, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh no, please! No. Oh, I'm gonna do this next week. I gotta draw it. I'm gonna okay, draw it. I, I gotta tell you guys something real. Okay, quick. okay. Um, the zoo that I'm working at, it's it's the North Georgia Zoo, and one of their camels was actually used for a Geico Hump Day um, event. Oh, and, really? You don't know how many times I've seen and heard Hump Day since starting work here. <laughs> oh, no. It's, it's hilarious. Um, I feel bad for you. I now that celebrate I, Hump Day. Now that I think about it, Dinochirus does kind of fit the bill as kind of a dinosaurian answer to camels, you know, with the whole hump and then the long neck and, you know. Yeah. Now That's that actually I think very about it, interesting. I can totally see that. I can yeah. totally see that. Louis the head is still Ray. a little weird, but... Yeah, Louis Ray hey. did an image once, and it, he covered it with a woolly kind of proto-feathers, and it looked... And it had stripes a bit on it. it. It was really, really weird. It was just out of nowhere. It looked like a freaking nature, if you look it up. Or maybe if we can show it podcast. You know, guys, I just... Freaking nature. I just got a really speculative idea. Now, i have not... Camels have never been particularly interesting to me, so I've never been looking up what their skeletons look like. But do they actually have high rises in their in their vertebra for where the no. hump is? No, yeah, no. It's it's so, entirely. It's entirely yeah, I was thinking animals. about that too. So guys, think about this: if Dinochirus has a hump and is an ornithomimosaur, but you're saying the camels don't always have like you know they don't have the risen vertebra. Could we speculate that other ornithomimosaurs would also have humps and be similar in that nature? Like, do you, because the whole camel dinosaur thing, like, is really interesting, and I, I don't know, like, like I wouldn't be surprised if other ornithomimosaurs had that. Like, not not all of them, but you know, like they. I doubt ornithomimus would have well, it. Well, you it's more in a wet environment. Yeah, because the thing is. Um, you can have two animals that are extremely close relatives of each other that look nothing alike because the way an animal looks it depends on the environment it lives in rather than its kinship. Yes, a tiger and a lion. Exactly, tigers and yeah, lions. Exactly. So it is a it is an interesting notion, but um, 
I don't think it holds much water. I don't know if you got the <laughs> pun there. <laughs> that borders in the very highly speculative area. Yeah. yeah. Um. But you could go in that yesterday's book. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also interesting that it could probably have a huge waddle on its head, like Pelicomimus, how it had that growth that wasn't skeletal on the back of its head. Yeah. Or what else am I thinking of? I, I don't think that a monosaur thing has actually been proven. Because it might have been growth on its neck or something. I can't remember. Yeah, that's true. Somebody was um, questioning that. Yeah. Um, who was it? It was one of those... I think it was Wee Long on DA. Yeah, it was one of them skeletal artists. Um, what do you yeah. think about Dinochirus, Terry? <laughs> oh, man, here we go. Oh, no. <laughs> I've been I've been paying attention to it, but I think I think it would have had a lifestyle similar to a hadrosaur. Okay, I could see that. That's kind of where I've been running with it lately, especially when you look at the skull. Yeah, if anybody's actually exactly. looked at the skull from the photos, but the thing yeah. has like a spoonbill thing going on with it. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know, the first thing that came to my mind was sort of a waterfowl-type lifestyle, like a crane or something, but then it's just so weird. So it does, the body doesn't really fit it. Yeah, yeah. speaking of waterfowls, um, there is a modern uh, bird called a spoonbill, and um, I just Googled it right now, and it kind of looks like our dinosaur right now. And um, Yeah, that's what Terry was saying, yeah. Kind of a spoonbill looking head Dinochirus has. Dude, that's like a, that's like a match. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, um, right. <laughs> one part of the body. <laughs> yeah, right. It would uh, it wouldn't be too surprising if Marty's on the right track and this was a semi aquatic animal because one of the things I think about when I look at Dinochirus and the whole the shape of its body, how it has the sort of hump and the long arms, it does really recall you to a Spinosaurus, and it kind of makes me wonder if it was living similarly to a Spinosaurus, having a sort of semi aquatic lifestyle, feeding on like aquatic prey. Huh. Like, might have been an Orthomimosaurus uh, answer to semi-aquatic Spinosaurus-like lifestyle. Yeah, I guess. because uh, that actually Dinochirus that actually makes sense to me. Dinochirus I can is actually from the see late that. and Spinosaurus, the Spinosaurus is like you know the last of those, and he actually dies out pretty early in the Cretaceous. Like when when you really look at the timeline, the Spinosaurus are like kind of just after the Jurassic, and they they kind of go up to about mid-Cretaceous, and then they vanish. Well, think about it, too. Most of the dinosaurs with uh, large skeletal humps, besides maybe Aranosaurus, were living in the water. Or at least partially. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that, something to think about. That is an interesting speculation. I actually like that. I actually really do like that. It makes sense. Because um, you wonder almost if maybe Dinochirus used its its hump almost like um, fishing birds do their feathers, where they you know fan them out and create a shadowed area where fish are attracted to, and all and like you know some scientists speculate Spinosaurus used its hump for. You wonder if Dinochirus was the same way, you know. But then, yeah, I could, uh, I've been thinking I could... about that. I sorry, David. Go ahead. No, you go, Fred. Oh well, I was thinking about how I, I was thinking about putting that in a project I was working on, which was like a dinosaur series. But I was wondering how would that work? I mean, wouldn't the animal, like Spinosaurus, have to twist his whole twist all the way to his right or left? And then not only that, but have to move forward in order to catch all those fish it would or have a to fish. Move pretty fast. Actually, yeah. Fred, I mean it's no. striking sideways, not forward, right? Actually, Fred, um, I and to answer you with that, um, I was once watching a a sort of a YouTube video that was uh, special on a snake called the tentacle snake, 
And it's this aquatic snake that feeds on fish and has a, 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 um, a hunting strategy that addresses this exact thing you're talking about. When it attacks a fish, it, the fish usually comes at it from the side. What it would do is it would undulate its body to create a shock wave to take advantage of the fish's lateral line system and its hardwired instincts. When the fish feels that water pressure change, it instinctually turns around and moves away from the, uh, the, the wave. So what the snake is able to do is it can actually tr trick the fish into swimming right into its mouth by triggering a shock wave behind it so it swims towards it. If Spinosaurus was able to... Um, you know, use the shade to gather fish to a certain area. It, it, what if it had an ability to, uh, I, I don't know how it would exactly execute it, but what if it did something similar to that, where it disturbs the water in, like um, on that side so the fish swim past it and it leans down and picks them up to attack? Maybe, maybe, like, yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly how a Spinosaurus would pull that off, but... Um, like, it, it would be interesting if it was able to do something like that, because um, uh, other than that, yeah, like you were saying, it would have to be extremely quick to be able to pull that off. Yeah, but not only that, he's got these huge, one of his arms would be in the way because they're, his arms are huge, right? So that might have been quite a bit to just snap to your left or right, well, the, just the, with that big arm in the way the and all that water. The claws of Spinosaurus might have, might have been the part work, of the arsenal, actually. you know. Yeah. So, oh, without a doubt. Because um, they were obviously, you know, modified and hook-like, you know. They yeah. could have served. You know, that that is an interesting idea. And, um, and then, of course, uh, there is um, – this was illustrated very well, this whole um, speculated hunting pattern. Um, was illustrated very well by um, I'm trying to remember his name. He's an artist on DeviantArt. Uh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, his name starts with a J. It's like Julius. Julio. Uh, Julio. Julio Lasardo. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. He he illustrated it very well. Where he he drew, and I actually bought a print version of that, and I I have I have the print framed version of that painting. I loved it so much. But it just seems like a very natural behavior for Spinosaurus. Oh, yeah. Um, and, of course, there's no... I don't know if there could could ever be any way we could confirm that behavior. Um, you know, because that's just one of the things that I don't think there'd be any fossil traces of. Um, oh, no, so yeah. I think it's always going to remain in the realm of speculation, but I think it's very plausible for Spinosaurus to have exercised that hunting um, strategy. That's what I think. Um, to add on to the Spinosaurus um, feeding behavior, uh, an idea just occurred to me that a lot of times people imagine Spinosaurus to live in swampy, mangrove kind of areas where there are a lot of um, trees and, and roots and things that are submerged in water. I'm now thinking, what if Spinosaurus adopted a sort of sit-and-wait strategy to where its arms and jaws would be in the water and they would hang down in a way that would resemble roots, and it simply patiently waits for like a sizable fish to you know approach it to you know hide in it as cover and you know when it's within reach it would simply lash out and attack using its arms and you know jaws to grab a hold of the fish and it would um just sort of like take advantage of its surroundings because like even though spinosaurus is so large assuming the water is like you know maybe knee high at best and it's not moving very much it would have no problems I'm pretty sure most fish wouldn't really just look at it and immediately point it out. It, it would kind of seem like part of the environment, like some kind of large tree or something. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. And, and consider, too, that um, grizzly bears are, are excellent um, anglers, fishers, and um, they don't have any special adaptations specifically for fishing. They have a very generalistic, opportunistic body plan. But they're still excellent fishers, you know, and they're known for, for catching trout and, and fish that come upstream to, to breed, you know. So, you know, with or without the use of, of its hump for fishing, no doubt Spinosaurus was a pristine um, piscivore. 
Oh, yeah. And, um... Uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, Spinosaurs... I, I, I don't really think their their diet is much of a mystery anymore. I think it's mostly just the ways they hunted, which, you know, are left out, up to speculation that we like to think about. But um, There is one question that's burning inside my head. <laughs> Where the hell did Spinosaurus come from? <laughs> Megalosaurids. <laughs> yeah, I figured they would because I've heard that a lot, but I don't... Yeah. The first time it. I ever heard that, I was actually rather surprised. Like, the transition seemed so so strange to me to actually, like, kind of, like, think about. I mean, I suppose going from Eustriptospondylus, perhaps, to Baryonyx might not be too crazy of a leap, but it's like just no. seeing the, the vast yeah. difference. I will admit, though, when you look at the body of a megalosaur, like a like a torosaurus or something, the way the arm, how big the arms are and the legs in comparison to the body, the general proportions are actually pretty consistent with spinosaurus. Like when when you just look at them, like we like kind of like cut off their heads and forget about that for a minute, but then look at the actual body, they do have a pretty similar body plan. Yep. Yeah, I yeah. I do believe the accepted. Um, the accepted lineage of Spinosaurs is that they are Megalosaurs. Um, they're just, you know, really specialized Megalosaurs. Um, and it does make sense, seeing as they have so much competition from the Allosaurs, like Fred. Right, yeah. <laughs> what? And, and two, you have to consider that, um... Even though Spinosaurids look a lot different from Megalosaurs, you know, and other dinosaurs, you know, um, just because something looks different, you know, you really can't leave classification up to superficial resemblance, you know, because you really wouldn't get anywhere like that. You know, if you relied on... Uterinus looks like an Allosaurus, but it's not. Right, Yeah, it looks exactly. a lot like Allosaurus, you know? but it's not. It's weird. I mean, you really have to... You really have to look at, you know, just the subtle details in their anatomy to really um, piece together their family trees. Um, you know, because, cause, you know, like I was saying with, you know the lion and the tiger, I mean, there can be two animals that are barely, very closely related, um, you know, but they they still look like they're totally different animals. Um, and um, what are your thoughts on this, Terry, since I know you have something to say yeah. about it? Saying about Streptospondylus. No, Streptospondylus is actually recovered to be in, phylo, in recent phylogenetic studies closer to be to Spinosauridae. Hmm. Okay. So I didn't know that. You know, I've just I've been looking it up so I can make sure before I say anything because I don't want to speak in error. Right. Right. Well, that's me all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. At least you're honest, Fred. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh. <laughs> but the problem with Streptospondylus is that it has very scrappy remains. From what right. And it seems it almost seems to be that way with a lot of megalosaurs. Yeah. You know, I was going to say, you know, with Spinosaurus, we have very little material of them, considering they lived in watery environments. So well, you think know... they'd be preserved better? Yeah. And, you know, obviously we have more material of, of Spinosaurus such as Baryonyx than we do Spinosaurus itself. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't really think there's much debate as to, you know, how different Spinosaurus are related to each other. And I think, I'm not sure how complete the most complete Spinosaurid um, specimen is, but... Um, I think it's Baryonyx. I Sucumimus. 
Actually, is it Tsukamima? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if all of that is what was recovered, but I know they have full skeletal mounts of Tsukamima at the Chicago Museum. I think all we really need is an obvious intermediary between, you know, typical megalosaurids and spinosaurids. So, right. that's, you know, and that has yet to happen, obviously, but um, I think it's a fairly good prediction where, you know, that has been made. Um, but, you know, I mean, things change all the time with um, taxonomy, cladistics, whatever you use. Yeah. Um, you know, because I know, um, I think Cryolophosaurus, um, its classification it has been thrown yeah. around quite a bit. Yeah, it has. Um, in fact, I don't even know, is it still considered a Dilophosaurid? Let me check. Well, last uh, I checked, wasn't the Dilophosaurid clay just smashed into Coelophysoids? Man, I don't touch that area. Yeah, see, and that's that's the problem, <laughs> is just, you know, classification. I want to say yes, is, but I want to be sure first. Right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that, um, I was thinking that, um, Cryolophosaurus was, uh, moved to Ceratosauria. I, like, I don't remember the last time I looked it up, but I believe it, it was somewhere in there, actually. It's saying Basil Tedinure right now. For yeah, that's always what I've been, yeah, yeah, for that's what I always hear. Yeah, and I think that was actually a fairly recent reclassification. I remember reading a reading something about that that was published, um, you know, made a few rounds in in the realm of paleontology, um, at least on the internet. So, you know, it's hard to say um, with, with Spinosaurus. Yeah, because it's also, it's also, when I check the Wikipedia for it as well, too, since Wiki's usually up to date about this stuff, Yeah, it has a debatable under Cryolophosaurus. But also something of interest, too, they have uh, mega raptors now related to Tyrannosaurids. What? You know, oh, wow. I what? actually, I, I, I was, when I was doing research on Australovenator, they were saying there was a tentative Tyrannosauroid. I'm like, really? That thing's, like, like it screams Allosaur. I don't know how they're saying it's a Tyrannosauroid. Apparently, they did a recent study on it and reclassified it, and it's still debatable. Wow. I did not even know after. about that. Uh, I was... Wow, I, that went right over my I head. I was in the dark <laughs> about I've been that trying to find completely. the paper for it, but I can't yeah. find it anywhere. Man, you're going to have to... <laughs> you're going to have yeah, to send that to us or something. When I find it, right. if you ever find it. Will. Yeah. Awesome. Mine? Wow, that's... <sighs> That's a mega raptor. It's a tyrannosaurid. Man, yeah. everything that looks like an allosaurus is tyrannosaurid. No. <laughs> Quiet. Next friend. thing you're gonna tell me, allosaurus <laughs> is a tyrannosaur. <laughs> no, guys. I find it kind of ironic how you go from uh, something like a mega raptor with these, like, probably the most badass claws of any dinosaur in prehistory, to something like a tyrannosaur with very reduced yeah. arms. And how do you yeah. make that transition? <laughs> Like, like, I figure something with arms like Megaraptor will want to keep those. You know what I've noticed, too, about um, f very fragmentary discoveries such as Megaraptor is that they all go through a very similar pattern where they're the first thing, like right off the bat, they're, they're classified as dromaeosaurs. Like, oh, look at this claw. It's right. totally a dromaeosaur. And then it gets, you know, slapped back with... Um, you know, allosaurs and all those dinosaurs. And then, you know, finally it, it gets a more appropriate classification. But it all, they all seem to go through a similar process. It's It just seems a little weird to me. With how they're doing the families and everything, think of it like a tree instead of a line of progression. It's, it's a tree. Yeah. It has many branches coming off yeah. from it and spreading into other branches and sticks and so forth. Yeah, I, I was once looking at a, a, a cladogram of uh, all theropod dinosaurs because I just wanted to track the evolution. And there were the it was actually astounding to me 
just how many groups of dinosaurs spawned from the Allosaurids. Like, you, you, oh my goodness, so many different kinds of dinosaurs came from the Allosaurids. They're like the majority of the theropods uh, genre. All fell Probably the Tyrannosaurids of their day. Yeah. For the and Tyrannosaurids compete. Sh- shut up, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you say bears for the win in the state chat, you have to shut up. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Fred. I'm sorry. But yeah, uh, yeah, as you were saying, David, funny, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and um, something I thought that was interesting about Allosaurus is from what it seems like, it seems like you have the original base Allosaurus and like, you know, like a sort of fake and axe, they were like the sort of originals. And then later it seems like the Allosaurus diversified, but they decided to go two ways, well, not decided, but you know what I mean. Like they went two ways evolutionarily. You got the larger Allosaurus, like the Carcharodontosaur forms or whatever, with the, like the more large head focusing on the bite. And then you had the other Allosaurus where they, they had like claws and I was, you know, I was thinking that these Megaraptorans were Allosaurs, and they went the more of the claw route. And I think like the Neovenator and stuff like that, like they're they're more slashy than bitey. I thought it was interesting how the Allosaurs seem to break both ways. Yeah. Well, it's good, good news is that Neovenator is is still considered an Allosaurid. Yeah. What about Australovenator? I'm looking that up right now. Give me a second. Yeah, no, that's the Mega Raptor. Oh. So, arguably, Mega Raptora is. Um, they are actually Silurosaurs. Yeah. That's what it's looking like a member of Tyrannosauroidia. Okay. So, so they're actually Tyrannosauroids then? Yeah. All right, yeah. no, feather Nazis, don't go crazy. Oh, yeah. See, yeah, keep Fabio on. Pastore. They should have called Austro a Venator. They should have named it after Steve Irwin. I like Fluffy Down, but sometimes they take it too far. Yeah, I think, don't have the the heavy feather, I think some of the feather restorations are a little bit much. Like, I accept there's feathers on Tyrannosaurids. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of do, too, yeah. yeah. Like, I've come someone, to accept that. Someone had did a good uh, uh, restoration of what a feathered Tyrannosaur would look like, and I think it's my favorite. Um, not only the Stomping Land version, which is really beautiful, but the guy who did... Um, someone drew the first Lithorax paintings that, that you saw everywhere on the news and whatnot. He did a really great job. I can't remember what his name was on Divine Art. Obler... Oloro Titan. That's that's his name. Oh, I know that guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. He does wonderful paintings, and his Lithorax came out perfect. I yeah. loved it. it. It looked more like fur, and it, it wasn't, like, fluffy, and it wasn't super thick, like an emu or something like that, but it, it just looked really nice. Alora Titan on DeviantArt is who we're talking yep. about. Yeah, for our viewers. That's Spudosaurus, though. Fred, this should be your favorite. <laughs> Shameless plug-in. Shameless plug-in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's my second favorite. Oh, <laughs> no, this good is enough. the T-Rex I did on DeviantArt. <laughs> no. It looks sort of... It has. I give it a fluffy mane. I actually did think of doing that with Tyrannosaurus too. I think it's Oh yeah. I think um I think feathered dinosaurs is another topic for another day, but I will say this about it. Um I personally um put feathers on dinosaurs where um feathers are known from fossil evidence on their close relatives, you know. Um such as, you know, Microraptor. I, I'm, I'm fairly confident in saying that all of its relatives, even the ones that don't have um, evidence for feathers yet, I'm willing to say that they were all definitely feathered. Um, same with all of Velociraptor's relatives and all of um, 
Uterinus and and Dilongs relatives, and you know just just phylogenetically, just how those, you know, kind of like you know if if one if the, if the, you know kind of like if the tiger has fur, then the lion would have fur too. You know, just kind of that mindset is kind of where I do. So I I don't put feathers on dinosaurs outside of Silurosauria, but it seems to me like feathers are present across a wide enough range of Silurosauria to safely um, propose that all Silurosaurians were feathered to a degree. That's that's the stance I take. Um, yeah, it, you can, you can um, infer yeah. it. I, I wouldn't call it an assumption more as an inference, because like you were saying, it's just phylogenic. Some like some probably have more feathers than others. We know that a lot of the dinosaurs, like Mycoraptor, have very advanced feathers that other uh, Silurosaurs wouldn't have had on them. Yeah. But uh, in general, I think it would be safe to infer that pretty much most, if not all, Silurosaurs had feathers. But once I start seeing things like you know, fluffy Allosaurus or like Spinosaurus or friggin' Carnotaurus. like Carnot, yeah, a feathery Carnotaurus, shoot me, please. That's yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Uh, I well, would fine. never go that route. <laughs> I've seen a picture I, of a like a baby yeah. sauropod with fluff on it. That was a little uh, weird. Yeah, I see that. That's a little much for me. I I don't go that far. Yeah, yeah, there was some, there's there's some, there's someone, someone did a painting, does, he does paintings, I think he's in the, lives in the Middle East or was, from, I can't remember his name, but he did, he put not only feathers on Allosaurus, like a really thick coat, but he also put it on Hadrosaurus, and we don't, you know, that's like a, kind of a big no-no. Um, I hate to be the, I hate Fair to be that, that guy, but we are kind of st- we kind of are straying off topic from the feeding yeah. habit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. But um, I like to go back to Allosaurus. Um, I know we were talking about its hatchet bite, but I don't think it's realistically possible for it to keep whacking its head like it's been proposed onto a prey item Oh yeah. over and over again. I think a more plausible answer would be it would latch onto its prey with those teeth to to keep it on there and then use its arms to pin it down and then start oh, yeah. biting and slashing so it couldn't get away. At least for smaller prey like Camptosaurus. Yeah, I mean, because you have to consider, too, um, you know, attacking larger prey like sauropods, which I'm pretty sure there's there's decent evidence for. Yeah, at least for um, Giganotosaur, I think. Yeah, and and I guess that's kind of the, the ecological niche that most... Allosaurs are placed into is opportunistic sauropod hunters. That's just what it seems like to me, and I don't know how much evidence there is for it, um, but that just seems to be where they are commonly placed. Um, and I know wasn't it wasn't it the big owl specimen that had some healed wounds that had been delivered by sauropods, or or, or am I remembering it wrong? Uh, it might might have been sauropods or another allosaur. It was allosaur. a stegosaur. Oh. Yeah. It was a stegosaur thagomizer puncture. That was a different uh, specimen. I think. Oh yeah, it wasn't Big Al, but it was an allosaur. Because yeah. Big Al had several wounds. Oh yeah. Um, that had healed, and I I remember I remember one of them being um being rib. a laceration rib fracture from. A sauropod tail that had healed. Um, I don't know if I'm remembering that right, though. I don't know about what I caused it, was but debatable. there was there was the ribs, there was the toe, of course, and then there was part of the tail, and also one of his arms. I think that was all that went wrong. Those were the injured but healed areas. I think it's debated in what exactly caused them. It could have been interspecific comp- like fighting, for all we know. Yeah, it could have been. Um, yeah, I don't know, actually, what um, Allosaurs... I don't even know if we know their um, their social patterns, either. You know, and that really would factor into what kind of prey they hunted. You know? Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. And there's honestly not a lot of good 
paleontological evidence pertaining to social patterns in dinosaurs. You know, there's there's evidence of herding in in you know some of the Ornithischian dinosaurs, and I think in sauropods as well. Um, you know, for example, there are those footprints or those um, those trackways, those fossilized trackways down in Texas of a herd of sauropods um, being stalked by um, an Acrocanthosaurus. Yeah, um, Luxie River. So, and hey, actually, isn't that um, couldn't that be considered um, evidence pointing to um, jumping on sauropods? I was gonna bring this this exact thing up because uh, the Paluxy River Acrocanthosaurus. Yeah. yeah, and I've I've been there myself multiple times, and I've seen the trackways and everything, and it is pretty obvious that there was a herd of sauropods, and then there was an Acrocanthosaurus. Um, yeah, and I think that because I believe Acrocanthosaurus is a Carcharodontosaurid, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, that I think lends credibility to the notion that um, those types of um, predators did actively hunt sauropods. Although I guess we don't know if it was going for a healthy adult or if it was just going for a young one and wouldn't ever mess with something, you know, that much bigger than itself. So it's really hard to say exactly what it was doing following the herd. Right. Um, but we well, know if it was a herd, it was probably going after a younger, more weaker member, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we know that it was following the herd, but why was it following the herd? You know, what was it hunting, you know? or or yeah. Maybe it wasn't even following the herd itself. Maybe there was, I don't know, who, who knows? Um, I don't know. Because you just – I think it was – it was really walking with dinosaurs that kind of instilled in us the idea that allosaurs were um, – Pack hunters. Yeah, pack hunters, sauropod predators, you know. Yeah, what's the evidence for that? I've never actually seen a paper Terry just, published about Terry that. Terry just sent um, a link to – um, the paper on the uh, hatchet bite that we were discussing earlier. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll read that then. But, yeah, I'm not sure what the hard evidence for oh, yeah. sauropod hunting is. Yeah, this is what I was going to bring up. That's the photo I was going to bring up in the Skype. That oh. I was, that's, that's the one I was talking about. How hatchet the hatchet bite doesn't really work. I mean, like it says in the description, if you if an animal like Allosaurus or even Torvosaurus did it, that kind of hatchet bite on the small animal or even a sauropod, it would definitely hit the bone and that'll just hurt. I mean, taking the right. tooth and ramming it into a bone that thick, it's gonna it's gonna break not only break but it's gonna hurt the animal. Especially so you know, I find it real interesting though. Is it, its bite? Its bite is weaker than a lion's, but the amount of stress yes. it could withstand is a lot higher. That's yeah. what—that's what really bugged me, and I thought, well, why? That doesn't make any sense. And still, the hatchet idea still doesn't really make any sense to me. But maybe, like in the image above, where it's attacking the sauropod, maybe <laughs> the the middle image, not the first one. Maybe it, instead of ramming its head into it, but instead. Yes, kind of pushing its head onto it, but just trying to make it bleed as much as it could. Kind of like the Giganotosaurus from Chased by Dinosaurs. Just start cl clawing it and making it bleed as much as it could. Yeah. Especially in the leg areas. Um, do we know exactly if it's the amount of stress it could take by rent? Like, what if it was used for a head butting? I don't know. Because the I'm not really could break, familiar right? with. Um the skulls of allosaurs. Yeah, I'm more of a tyrannosaur yeah, guy. Yeah, so I don't know how much I could contribute to that. Because I know they couldn't wiggle their skulls from the side to side like a tyrannosaurus. They're more of a slice, slice and dice up and down. Yeah, tyrannosaur, tyrannosaurus itself, at least, was, was the one that would just go in there and just bite right to the bone. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's not. I know that's something that Allosaurus wasn't, yeah. you know, built for. Yeah, but then again, 
the Allosaurus has much longer neck. So maybe it was using its neck to wiggle. It could have used its neck to wiggle the head from side to side, but wiggle, not... Wiggle, 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 wiggle. <laughs> I'm rotate still, its head from side to side, but I'm not really at the ball and hinge by, point. I'm still disturbed by the, la- the apparent lack of ev- hard evidence for Allosaurus actually hunting sauropods, though. Um, yeah. Because... Yeah, I think we definitely need to follow up on that sometime after doing some research, maybe, because... Yeah, because um, the yeah. evidence it's, of the teeth marks in the sauropod bones isn't an absolute, you know. Yeah. Because you, you always have to keep in mind scavenging, too. Yeah. I'm also more disturbed by we have no evidence of ceratosaur hunting. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Cerat- what was Ceratosaurus doing? Smaller. I feel like they would have been in a different environment than Allosaurus. Well, for it to have, for it to have coexisted with Allosaurus, it would have kind of had to have been kind of like uh, Carcharodontosaurus and Spinosaurus, where their their ecological niches were just totally different, and so they they didn't conflict with each other, even though they were both very large predators living in the same environment. And I think it was the same. It would have had to have been the same way with Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus, you know, kind of like um, kind of like a lion and a hyena. But I guess the question is, which one was the lion and which one was the hyena? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. And I don't like referring to Ceratosaurus as a strictly a hyena, but you know hyenas do hunt more than lions, so. Yeah, well, I mean, la- I mean they're both crazy, but the hyenas, I mean, the jaw power—it's crazy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, take yeah. Almost but hyenas anything. are boss. They could take everything a lion could take, or maybe even more. You know. Well, well yeah. actually, yeah. they can't really take on a giraffe. And, and they're very, elephant, but, you know intelligent. what I mean. Intelligent. Sometimes pack hunters too, and they do live in family groups. Yeah, um, like little clans. Yeah, and I think yeah. just just ecologically, I think if we could find more more hard evidence of the lifestyle some dinosaurs lived, we could compare them to the ecological niches um, some dinosaurs um, or some animals occupy today, and you know reasonably hypothesize, you know, the lifestyles that they had, you know, in regards to, you know, Ceratosaurus versus Allosaurus and the different roles they played in the environments they lived in. So, yeah. it's just, it's hard to say, you know, and behavior is just not one of those things that fossilizes very well, you know, because it always has to be inferred from the, you know, the solid evidence we have, you know? Right. Um, you never you never see a behavior in action when it comes to the fossil record. You always see the aftermath of that behavior, and that just makes it hard to, to kind of do the detective work and figure out how that animal actually lived and what it was eating, and you know? So... I think for the most part, I think for the most part, um, dinosaur feeding habits are largely speculative, and there's a few exceptions, such as spinosaurids, which, you know, we know fairly well that they were piscivores, and that they, they did feed primarily on aquatic life, and they were, they were built, you know, for that kind of lifestyle, but right. generally, I mean, it's it's just it's all it's all up to the imagination, and it is frustrating. But you know, and that's the fun of paleontology. Yep, and I think that's you get to imagine. And I think that's why speculation is such an important part um, in paleontology. And I, I really like um, I really like the book All Yesterdays which I'm, I know you guys are familiar with, so I'm probably being redundant mentioning it. But, you know, the whole idea that speculation, if treated respectfully, can be a beneficial contribution to um, paleontology. And I have a quote, actually. Let me pull it up here. Um, 
I think it sums up everything we've been talking about pretty well. Um, and by the way, we got a few more minutes, so we should probably wrap it up. All right, I'll 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 end my own rant on this note then. Um, with you know, with regards to you know speculation, and really that's what it is. You know, um, I really like what uh, paleobiologist Matt Weddle said. Um, uh, the way the way he put it. Um, with regards to speculation in paleo art, is um, he said, if you go bold, you won't be right. However, what you dream up is not going to be the same as whatever outlandish structure the animal actually had. You know, and that could be applied to what <laughs> outlandish behavior that animal had, or what outlandish diet that animal actually had. Um, but then, on the other hand, if you don't go bold, you'll still be wrong, and now you'll be boring too. So, you know, I think. Yeah. I think speculation, you know, it, it's really make it's really about making predictions for future discoveries, you know. And if if you if you end up being proven right by a future discovery, you know, or not, then that's just the way it is. And yeah. I just I just hope that some of the speculations that we have eventually get confirmed, or at least um, or at least uh, you know denied with solid proof backing that up that, you know, whether or not we were right or not, you know, and that's what I'm looking forward to, and that's one of the things that really fascinates me so much about paleontology. So. Yeah. Yeah. Just want the answers. Yeah. Because we know the answers are going to be awesome. (laughs) Yep. Well, all right. I think that was a really good uh, discussion there. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Terry. Well. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I'd like to in the future, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Should I end this? It's like... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for know. coming and listening. Yeah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning into the Carpalites. As you can clearly see, we take shit seriously. <laughs> <laughs>